So this may turn out to be our last in-person class during the semester. After the spring recess, we'll shift to distance. And it therefore seems especially appropriate that I use this class to summarize and generalize the programmatic argument uh, explored first in the American and then in the European context. And in the virtual classes following the spring recess, we have a twofold agenda. First, to deepen certain aspects of the discussion of a progressive political economy, of the creation of a high energy democracy, and of the alternative direction of education against the background of a larger view of the formation of the capable individual. Uh, those are the substantive programmatic themes. Uh, and then there are the social theoretical themes. The way of thinking about structure that underlies both the programmatic argument uh, and the idea about the relation between the substantive agenda and the formation of the social and cultural alliances that might support it. And second, once again, the issue of the ideal and how we should think of the distinction between progressives and conservatives. Now, according to the plan laid out in the syllabus, I would describe the final writing exercise for all students who are enrolled, whether graduate or undergraduate, in the first class after the spring recess. But I will attempt to anticipate that and to write to you, perhaps during the spring recess, and tell you what the assignment is. Uh, and then, uh, as you may remember from the syllabus, it is due only on April 30. Now, before I proceed to the substance, let me ask if there are any organizational questions, especially given this change uh, that has turned out to be necessary in the method. I have no idea how the virtual teaching and learning will work out. Uh, I will attempt to learn, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, and uh, use it to best effect. Right, so the question is the, the, the general programmatic argument. To summarize it, and I would like in your engagement today to address less specific questions than the general character of this argument, the way of thinking that it embodies, and its implications for practical politics and reform in the contemporary societies. Uh, so I want to proceed in three steps in this summary. First, the point of departure, the idea about the situation of the world, and in particular, the predicament of the progressives that underlies this argument. Uh, then second, the main themes uh, explored in the United States and the European context, but with much more general application across the full range of contemporary societies. And then in the third part of today's discussion, the social theoretical and philosophical presuppositions of this argument, the way of thinking about structure and structural alternatives, 
and the way of thinking about the ideal that should inform such an alternative. So first, the point of departure. Uh, the starting point is the observation that the whole world is now bent under the yoke of a dictatorship of no alternatives. After the calamities, adventures, and wars of the 20th century, it seems that uh, large-scale ideological alternatives, plans for the radical reconstruction of society have been discredited. Even if we continue to use the ambitious ideological vocabulary of this earlier historical period. And there is now in the world a dictatorship of no alternatives, by which I mean that there is a very restricted repertoire of live options for the organization of different areas of social life. And that repertoire then becomes the fate of the contemporary societies. Uh, deep thinking about society and history and politics uh, must rebel against this dictatorship and help provide us the conceptual instruments that we need to overthrow it. To understand something is always to understand what it can become. Uh, insight into transformative possibility is insight altogether. Without insight into transformative opportunity, we understand nothing about a historical circumstance. Then the focus in the understanding of this point of departure is the predicament of the progressives or of the left. And the characterization of that predicament can be summarized in four propositions. So the first proposition is that the progressives now, on the whole, have no project or no project that is effective to solve or even to address the fundamental structural problems of the contemporary societies. And to an increasing ex extent, they have no project or no adequate project, even in their own eyes. And one way of making this claim is to say, that they confront a dilemma in their thinking about what to propose that they have been unable to resolve. So on the one hand, they uh, they recognize that Compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer, progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements is not enough to define a progressive position and address the contemporary problems of these societies. Uh, but on the other hand, they also recognize that the affirmation of statism, of the state control of the economy, is no longer credible or acceptable. So the state control of the economy is too much. The compensatory redistribution is too little. What should they do? What should be the essence of their proposal? And in the wake of their inability to solve this dilemma in practice as well as in theory, uh, 
they then resign themselves to the circumstance of humanizing the project of their conservative adversaries. And one of the particular forms that that emphasis on humanization takes is with respect to the economy and political economy to have no productivist project. No project for the democratization of the economy on the side of supply and production, only on the side of demand and consumption. And more generally, no institutional agenda. No program for the reformation of the established economic and political institutions. Now, this situation is very grave. Uh, on the one hand, we know that the potency of a political project is inseparable from its institutional legacy. That's what has a lasting effect in history, the institutional consequences of a political project. The mere reallocation of resources and rights from one side to another, like the waves of the sea that come and go. What remains is the institutional legacy. On the other hand, the force that always commands the agenda in politics is always the force that most credibly embodies the cause of innovation, of energy, of construction. Never the force that merely attempts to put a human face on the form that this constructive energy takes. So this predicament is the description of an abdication. And it has often seemed that it doesn't matter in this circumstance whether the progressives or the conservatives will be in power. And the progressives have often been condemned to execute with a humanizing discount the project of their conservative adversaries. Now, a second way of describing the predicament of the progressives is that they lack now an obvious base, a constituency. Historically, the core constituency of the progressive forces or of the left parties was organized labor headquartered in the capital-intensive parts of the economy, and especially in mass production industry, the earlier most advanced practice of production previous to the emergence of the knowledge economy. But this constituency of the organized labor force in the capital-intensive parts of the economy is increasingly seen and ultimately comes to see itself not as the bearer of the universal interests of society or of the working classes, but as just one more special interest. And it shrinks quantitatively. It is a smaller and smaller part of the labor force. So what then should the left-leaning forces do? If they insist on maintaining this privileged connection to the core historical constituency, they gradually sink with it. into this special interest, into this citadel of uh, 
and their fate is tied to the fate of declining mass production industry, conventional industry. If, on the other hand, they cut their connection with this historical constituency, then it seems that they're pushed to a generic or indistinct quality of life politics. And they begin to lose their distinctive profile in the political and ideological debates of the, of the contemporary societies. Or they become these mere humanizers that I earlier described. Uh, the third aspect of the predicament of the contemporary progressives is that they lack in the historical circumstance the urgent crisis, the crisis of great dimension that could be their ally to force some transformation. So even if they had a clear transformative project, they lacked what the progressives in earlier historical periods, including the 20th century, had, which were great wars or economic collapse, as in the Depression of the 1930s, as their ally. And it would be necessary in some way to make up for the absence of a crisis of requisite dimension. For example, by creating institutions that diminish the dependence of change and, on crisis, such as the institutions of a high energy democracy. The fourth aspect of the predicament of the contemporary progressives is that they lack a way of thinking. A way of thinking about structure and structural discontinuity and structural alternatives in history. The heroic and dogmatic assumptions of classical Marxist theory about a closed list of alternative regimes about the indivisible character of each of these regimes, and about laws governing their foreordained succession have become literally unbelievable. But the contemporary social science and the established policy discourse offer no way of thinking about structure and structural alternatives. On the contrary, they suppress the structural imagination. The absence of a way of thinking about structure aggravates the argumentative dilemma that I depicted in our first class. If the proposal is too distant from what exists now, it is derided as utopian. And if it is too close to what exists, it is dismissed as feasible but trivial. And because we lack a credible way of thinking about structural alternatives, we then fall back on this fake criterion of political realism, which is proximity to the existence. And that's less a way of understanding than it is a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy but it helps support this dilemma that paralyzes or disorients the programmatic imagination. So that then is an evocation of the problem of the progressives in the most general terms across a wide range of contemporary societies. And let me stop there and, and ask whether you have reflected further on this, on this diagnosis, which then motivates the, the programmatic argument. Yes. Uh, 
No, it's not the Great War specifically. It's that the, the ideologies of communism and fascism in the, in the 20th century, the large-scale ad, transformative adventures were discredited. The wars had a, an important subsidiary role because they helped, as it were, crack society open to these transformative efforts. But what was discredited was the ideological adventurism. Yes. So in other words, a despotic vanguard that claims to speak both for the people and for history. Yes. Well, I would restate that in this way. Uh, so let me explain. So I speak as someone who believes that structural change requires both movement from the bottom up and movement from the top down. And that there is no way to circumvent the power of the state. To transform society just to, by transforming it department by department without contesting the power of the state. And the fundamental reason for that is that the state makes the laws. And the laws are the content of the institutions, which is the supreme prize in transformative politics. Uh, uh, but I would want to reinterpret your observation by relating it to a, a, a analogous problem that did come up in our discussion, which is the unreliability of dogmatic blueprints. So the liberals and the socialists of the 19th century did understand the primacy of structural change over non-structural change. But they had a dogmatic view of structural change. That is, each faction of the progressives was wedded to a blueprint, a system of rights, an institutional model, which was supposed to be the solution both to the development of the practical powers of society and to our rescue from entrenched schemes of division and hierarchy. And these dogmatic blueprints have been discredited. So then we confront this unprecedented problem of having to recognize the primacy of structural change while, underst while understanding the need to resist succumbing to a structural dogmatism. And there is a connection between structural dogmatism and authoritarianism or despotism. So the vanguard or the despot claims to speak for the people or for history. And there's no need to organize the experimental discovery of the national path. And that provides power for what you described as this concentration of authority. So that's, that's, that's the connection. So it seems to me that in response to you, I would want to register a agreement with that part of your observation, but with the qualification that in the organization of transformative practice, uh, 
the power of the state cannot be disregarded. In other words, we can't just circumvent this contest and have an idea of transformative practice that works only at the grassroots or at the periphery and never puts the power of the central state in question. So in other words, there's the idea that, that there's a clear path. The path doesn't have to be established experimentally. And if someone can grab central power with a sword, that, that force can cut the Gordian knot. Uh, because there's no epistemological restraint on the exercise of absolute power. It's a shortcut. So despotism or terror become shortcuts when the definition of the path is not in question. But the definition of the path is in question. So a familiar complaint, a cr critique of dogmatic classical liberalism or neoliberalism uh, is that the anarchic decisions of the market are superior to the decisions of the state because the market is a process of perpetual discovery. That the commander cannot enjoy this, this potential for experimental discovery. But the paradox is that that political faction then has a dogmatic conception of the market. It identifies economic decentralization with its established or inherited form. And so uh, here the whole impulse of the argument is toward the radicalization of an experimentalist impulse. And that does, as you imply in your remark, put a restraint on simple central power, which is anti-experimental. But that's not the same thing, and that was my qualification, as imagining that we can then simply dispense with central power with the contest over its control and its uses. This is the central point about the laws. And this argument is related to an argument about the role of the nation state in the development of humanity. So, and this came up also in our discussion of social cohesion. So the idea is society develops its, humanity develops its powers and potential only by developing them in different directions. And the, the legitimate role of the nation in a world of democracies is to represent a kind of moral specialization within humanity. Uh, and this specialization to be real must take institutional form. Now, who holds the shield and who defines the laws? The state. And that's why in this present stage in the history of humanity, the nation state has ascendancy, has an advantage as a terrain for transformation. It's not the only terrain, and it presumably is not eternally the main form of division within humanity. But it is the only form of division now that controls the loss. And that's what gives it this, this, this special privilege 
it's the, this function can then be perverted if the state is taken over by a vanguard that claims to speak in the name of history or of the people and acts according to a dogma. Because then we forfeit this experimental discovery of division. That's the connection. Yes? Yes, yes. And that um, also in localizing sort of to the extreme. Absolutely. Um, and, and putting the local on this sort of altar. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can comment on whether there is some hopeful path, if there is investment in the right process, if you will, like which could be democracy in you know some ideal form or whatever that Correct, means. correct. So you could say that there's a legitimate and an illegitimate, a better or a worse way of dealing with this problem that you're pointing to. So we don't know what the path is exactly. We have to be able to experiment with it. And therefore, one of the most important attributes of our political and economic institutions is that they help to organize their own revision in the light of experience. But that that observation doesn't exempt us from the need to have substantive ideas and a substantive proposal. So as you imply, there are many versions of the contemporary left that sink into a kind of proceduralism of, of, of activism. For example, the idea of participation. So we participate, we organize from the bottom up, we still have to know what to say, or what to think, or what to propose. So this is like a, to give another example that I referred to the other day in a different context. It has often happened in the contemporary world that when the progressives or even the liberals don't know what to do in other countries, not that don't sanctify their constitutions, as the United States does, they propose a constitutional convention. And then the question is, what will they propose in this constitutional convention? They don't know the answer to that question. And so what they end up, for the most part, proposing is a combination of a, pasti of a melange, a pastiche of contemporary constitutional arrangements with a long promise, a long list of social and economic rights. So the Constitution is then filled with these vain promises. And all of that is then standing in the way of a structural project. So the point, and this is also connected to the, to the argument about vanguardism or despotism, the experimentalist impulse or the privilege given to experimentalism does not excuse us from having to have a substantive project. And even experimentalism itself has to be organized and organized with the historical materials. What does it mean for the shape of the economic or political institutions? Yes? So we have the um, sort of FDR, the New Deal, and then social democracy Europe as sort of the last examples of... Of refoundation yeah. with an institutional project, yes. And then somewhere down the line, the conservative project, whatever it may be, becomes the dominant one to the point that even the left just seeks to humanize it. Well, let, let me interrupt just to qualify that. So what I would say, by way of describing the situation, is that for the reasons that we discussed, the historical social democracy has been hollowed out or has retreated towards a minimalism. Mm -hmm. And the minimalism is the retreat to the last line of defense, a high level of social entitlements, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, and liberalized, 
and especially with the emphasis on flexibility in labor markets. So then there is, has been, a dominant project in the North Atlantic world. And the dominant project could be described as the attempt of the centrist elites, uh, including the institutionally conservative social liberals and social democrats, to combine the social protection of the Europeans with the economic flexibility of the Americans within a barely adjusted version of the inherited institutional project. Now, a central claim of these arguments is that that program is unable to solve the structural problems of the contemporary society. For example, the consequences of the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, as evidenced by the insularity of the knowledge economy, for both economic growth and economic inequality. And the, and the failure of this hegemonic project of liberalized or eviscerated social democracy to solve those problems then creates the vacuum within which populist authoritarianism arises. And that brings us to today. That, according to this view, is the moment at which we are now, at which we're having this argument. Okay. So my specific question, though, is we also said that energy innovation and construction are necessary for successful political projects. And it seems to me that this liberalized or eviscerated social democracy has triumphed, and it's not energetic, innovative. Or it's not, no says, look, look at one of its consequences, uh, that there is in almost all these societies a slowdown in the rise of productivity. That's a very tangible expression of the problem. So, and so the debate about the knowledge economy could be translated into a discussion about a disappointment. So here's the disappointment. We had this wave of organizational and technological innovation that we loosely characterize as the knowledge economy. And it was supposed to produce exponential and broad-based economic growth. It hasn't. So despite the claims that, for example, it would lead through increasing returns to scale to exponential growth, what we observe, in fact, is stagnation in, in the rise of productivity. So it's not just that it has witnessed aggravating inequality through this chasm between the advanced and backward parts of the economy. It hasn't even been able to sustain growth. So there's the combination of relative stagnation with deepening inequality, uh, and then the working class majority feels dispossessed, and the middle part of the job structure in these economies is hollowed out. That then is the, the, the summary description of a failure by the centrist forces. The failure then produces the vacuum, and the populist authoritarianism rises in the vacuum. So this whole programmatic argument can be seen in different historical dimensions on, on a long view, which I often emphasize, but also on a short view. That it's, it's an argument, it's an intervention in this particular historical moment where the failure of this, this, li this liberalized version of social democracy has become clear, but there seems to be no alternative to it. Uh, so that's the, yes. Yeah, can you, can you speak to, I, I buy the part about like the reduction in growth. Uh, yes. Democracy, but I guess some European social democrats have pushed back and say the whole narrative from FDR or the new social democracy, I don't know, after the war, they would also say that we have this third way for social democracy that would be feminist social democracy. So you have the computation of uh, female labor, women labor, and then you have Yes. Subside childcare, rent, becomes kind of intimate. Yes. 
Well, because there, so more broadly, there's the politics of identities uh, that are not class identities, uh, such as gender identity. And obviously, that's a very important dimension. But the fundamental difference is whether this recognition of identities uh, of historical forms of oppression uh, is promoted in the context of an alternative political economy and an institutional project or as an alternative to it. So let me give you a tangible example. So take one of our favorite countries, Sweden, the object of desire in the world, uh, this mythological Sweden. Over, so you, here, here's, here would be a simple description of the situation. There are three sectors in the economy. There is the tiny knowledge economy, which is an island. There are the declining mass production industries. Then there's this vast area of services. In the area of services, the caring economy, in which people care for one another. So in, in the real Sweden, as opposed to the mythological Sweden, the vast majority of jobs that have been created over the last decades are jobs in the caring economy, paid for by the state, and especially jobs for women. So the state pays women to take care of other people, um, in kindergartens and nursing homes and so forth. Uh, that's where the real growth of employment is. Uh, so you could say, well, women are coming into the labor force, but in, in that narrow way. So that, that's an example of the practical consequences of the dissociation of something that is, in principle, good, progressive, uh, the larger participation of women in the labor force, with something that is regressive, which is the failure adequately to address this hierarchical segmentation of the production system. So that's the kind of thing that has happened. Uh, and it's another example of the insufficiency of humanization. So that's what I would say. So uh, none of this, to my mind, impugns the greatest historical achievement of social democracy, which is the maintenance of a very high level of investment of the state in people and in their capabilities through endowments that are secure against economic volatility. That is, what social democracy has done, this is what I'm considering its greatest accomplishment, is to settle a, a package of endowments on the individual and take that package out of the agenda of short-term politics. This is what, in an earlier class, I described as the haven. But the counterpart to the haven should be the storm. And the storm is this organization in the economy and in politics of experiment, of alternatives. The storm is missing. So the, the, the haven should be the counterpart of the storm and not the substitute for the storm which is what it has, in fact, been uh, in the development of these, of these social democracies. And so there's the tangible material problem of economic slowdown. There's the problem of the increasing inequality. And then there's the spiritual issue that came up of belittlement. Is it natural for human life to be small, uh, in which think that we are awakened from this belittlement by the terrible ordeal of war, then we go back to sleep. And this, this situation is then appears to be natural. 
Uh, and that's another level at which one could engage the contest and say, it's not natural. This does violence to who we are, to who we can become. We have a higher ambition. And uh, so here, here's an underlying theme that's related to all of this. And it's a conviction. Uh, it's a conjecture. Uh, and it has a philosophical aspect. But it's, it's also an empirical proposition which is um, this eviscerated, abashed social democracy, the progressives generally in the contemporary world, are preoccupied primarily with the diminishment of inequality. And then objecting to this kind of argument that I've been developing throughout the semester, they could make a kind of minimalist, maximalist argument. They could say, you want us to raise the level of transformative ambition, to have a higher ambition, but we haven't even managed to preserve the essentials of humanization. So how could you ask for more? But that's precisely the argument. The argument is that we can't protect even the minimum unless we seek the maximum or to state the idea more aggressively, that the problem of inequality and exclusion, which is so close to the heart of the institutionally conservative social democrats, can be effectively addressed only in the midst of a wave to energize society and to create, create more wealth, more alternatives, uh, that we achieve greater equality in the midst of a wave to overcome mediocrity. And not by saying we accept this low level of ambition, but then at least we humanize. So it's this, this contrast which I'm trying to formulate, make explicit, which seems to me to be a very, a very deep question, because it's a question about our level of ambition, and, what, and as well about what, what we think is necessary to, to change. So just yesterday, I was, I was discussing this in another course. Uh, historically, in the short term, the greatest single influence on the diminishment of inequality has been war. Uh, and there's a long uh, literature about the economic and social effects of war. And why war? So there are different elements. So one element is growth. In the great wars, growth has accelerated. And we know as a fact that it's much easier to distribute or redistribute in the context of growth rather than in the context of economic stagnation. Growth with the enhancement of public revenue and the mobilization of national resources. So the second aspect of the consequences of, and then we could say, well, how can we have that without war? So that's the project of a war economy without a war. Uh, and part of the discussion about production could be translated into those terms. Then the second element in the consequences of war is that war has come together with radical institutional innovation. So it's not just large-scale mobilization of resources. It's that the large-scale mobilization of resources is rendered effective or fertile because it's combined with radical institutional innovation. So I gave the example of the Americans in the Second World War and the war economy. They cast aside their supposedly sacrosanct economic dogmas about how to run the economy. And for four years, they ran the economy in a completely different way with this uh, 
free-floating coordination between the state and the private firms, especially the big private firms, with spectacular results. Now, how can we have this plasticity without war? So we would need institutions that have this attribute of facilitating their own revision. That would be the interpretation. Now, then there's the third aspect of the consequences of war, which is solidarity. The people have suffered massive human sacrifice, and the elites or the political class feel the people must be rewarded for their suffering. There's an expectation in the whole nation that this suffering must be for something. But that doesn't exhaust this, the, the theme of solidarity in the aftermath of war, because there's something else which came up also in an earlier class, which is we are the beings who want to live for something greater than ourselves. And that's why in war we stop being depressed or killing ourselves, and we forget about ourselves, which is one of the premises of, of happiness, of flourishing. Uh, and so what does that mean in peacetime? It means the multiplication of forms of collective action, that we do more things together in more ways. Uh, and all these aspects of the interpretation of war for peace are related to this issue of the level of transformative ambition. What do we settle for? And that goes straight to the heart of the dispute about the ideal of the progressives. So wh what is the ideal? Is the ideal a shallow equality or a deep freedom? Uh, shallow meaning against the established institutional background. So the ambitious conception is the aim. The aim is to raise uh, human life to a higher level, the life of the ordinary man and woman greater intensity, greater scope, greater capability. And to do that through piecemeal but cumulative structural change. We become, we become bigger together. And that idea is related to the priority accorded to a specific form of equality. And this is a very important point that hasn't come up earlier in our conversations. So it's not a quality of outcome or circumstance. It's not a rigid equality of the result. But it is narrower and deeper than generic equality of opportunity. So what equality is it? It is equality of agency, of empowerment. And that seems to be the form of equality that is most important, in which uh, equality is related to greatness, to shared greatness, to shared bigness. So agency is the ability to act, and specifically to act not only in the context, but beyond the context and against the context, to stand up that the social order is not the ventriloquist, I'm not the puppet, uh, and I can turn the tables. That's agency. And so that, that is the form of equality with this affinity with, with bigness, with greatness, with empowerment, which is central to this understanding of the progressive project, that agency the enhancement of agency is not restricted to a small elite of heroes, of geniuses, of saints, of successful entrepreneurs. It's widely diffused in the whole of humanity. And that, on this view, is what the progressives should want and what they can achieve only through a series of institutional or structural changes. So would someone just like to remark on that conception of the kind of equality that counts and the way in which it is distinguished 
from the inequality of outcome on the one hand and from mere equality of opportunity on the other. I think that's a very important conceptual clarification which you say that the, the priority for the progressives is, in, is to empower, is the enhancement of agency. The, the enhancement of agency is the central normative conception. And uh, it is the point at which the idea of bigness or greatness communicates most intimately with the idea of equality. So we are... We want equality in our ascent to a higher form of agency. And all of our ideas about the economic and political institutions are related to that. So there's a fundamental contrast then also in the rhetoric of politics or in political practice between thinking of people as the beneficiaries of entitlements, of forms of co-option, of humanization, and thinking of them as agents to be empowered. And that's central. And it's, of course, abstract. But we give it content by translating it into this program. And of course, one of the dimensions is not just the, refor the reformation of the political and economic institutions, but also the radical change in the character of education. Because then what, what motivates our idea of education is the same conception of and the imagination, the, the anti-machine against the machine in the mind. Yes. Now, by the goods, you mean material benefits or rights? Yes. 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 In theory, we could have this like benevolent dictator that should save us, whatever we want, so that would be the good. But reduced us to the status of being passive beneficiaries of his largesse. Exactly. And so the idea is that that's not what we want or should want, ultimately. We want to have this capacity to turn the tables. So there is a substantive conception of our vocation. And then some, I guess, like Amartya Sen would say, okay, we, we want both access to the good and we want to choose. Yes. But would you go like even further and say, well, we actually want this to choose full stop? So that, that is agency. We want to maximize agency or want to equalize agency. And that is the only thing. Well, so, so again, it seems that the material benefits or benefits and rights can be an expression, an instrument, a condition of empowerment or an alternative to it. So the same thing. So shift the discussion. So take what could be said to be the, one of the architectural principles of the early English novel is the accumulation of things. So Robinson Crusoe on his island begins obsessively to, to hoard. He has no people. He just has one friendly slave. Uh, and, but he wants to accumulate things. And in this moral imagination, the accumulation of things is to some extent a substitute for dependence on people. So that's why we accumulate things. So, we, so that we not depend on people or depend less on them. So then you would say, we want things to be useful to supporting our interdependence and not to be a substitute for our dependence on people. So it's the same kind of argument that would be made in which, of course, uh, we're not disembodied agents, we're not angels, we have bodies, we have material needs. 
but the perversion occurs when the material needs are separated from our empowerment rather than being expressions of our capacity to act, to create, to innovate, uh, which is life itself. So ultimately, this is an argument about the supremacy of the good of life. What are the attributes of life? So it is, you could say first, surfeit, that we exceed the structure. We have more capacity for vision, for experience, for connection than can be accommodated by any particular arrangement of society and culture. Second attribute of life is fecundity. We have this ability to, to keep doing things, and, and which is indefinite, if not unlimited, indefinite. It's not divine omnipotence but it's this capacity to do more and more without fixed limits. And that's then related to a third characteristic of life, which is surprise. That we're able to surprise ourselves and to be surprised by others because we can diminish the power of path dependency, the power, the influence of the path on the future. Biographically and historically, we can create forms of life, ways of living, and institutions that diminish the power of the past over the future. Then we become freer and we come more fully into the possession of life. So this idea of equality and agency, of empowerment, is intimately connected to that philosophical conception. Of, it's it's a more life in the present moment, which is all that we have. And that then becomes the criterion. So what is the most important form of equality? It is equality with respect to that experience. And uh, it's not simply the distribution of material things, except insofar as the material things are related to that experience. Because of course, extreme poverty or even without poverty, extreme inequality through the accumulation of economic power by a few could undermine that experience. You were going to say something, yes. yes. Um, I was going to ask, what is the role of the progressive agenda in, um, in reorganizing informal institutions that, uh, that perpetuate inequality of in, did you say informal? Informal institutions. Like what? Like, uh, like oppression of women or racial that are socially constructed. So isn't it the same basic idea that would be reproduced in, in all these contexts of which, in which you would say, so, so let, let me, so, so it's, it's, so you say, what's the role of the progressive well, where project? The, where, do, where should progressives be thinking about intervening in terms of those kinds of structures? Um, not political, economic, educational specific, but more social. So in each social situation, there would be the same, it would be the same objective that the, the form of the, the form of the practice should be one that contributes to this equality, this sharing and empowerment. And you would apply that everywhere. Apply it to the institution of marriage, to the relation between men and women, to the relation of parents to children. Uh, uh, not as a separate thing, but as an expression of the same thing, which then is pursued in these many different contexts. But well, let me step back, and, and although this is not something I plan to do, uh, the unplanned things are always better than the planned ones. Uh, uh, so if you look very broadly, so the philosopher Hegel has a conception of estrangement. So the idea is in the primitive societies, we 
there's no developed subjectivity. But the individual feels at home in society, supposedly, according to Hegel. Uh, and then there's a, a long period of estrangement in which subjectivity develops, and the social order is alien to the subjective spirit. It's estrangement. Estrangement is not a feeling. Estrangement is an event in this conception. And then there would be a final stage in which we develop the institutions that are the worthy home of the spirit. And then we feel at home as we did at the first stage, but now with subjectivity, because subjectivity is reconciled with structure. Now, of course, there never was a moment in which we were at home. And there never will be a moment in which we develop the institutions that are the definitive home of the spirit. But so we have this possibility of progression. Progression is possible, but there's no definitive home. And the, the institutions that we develop in this middle period are defective in, in three main ways. This is just to unpack the concept of estrangement, not as Hegel presented it, as a kind of meta-narrative of the evolution of European society, but in another way, in a more general way. So first, there's the problem of subjugation. So coordination in large societies among large groups of people becomes a pretext for subjugation. So how can we prevent it from being a pretext for subjugation? By separating as much as possible the genuine imperative of coordination, which requires some element of hierarchy, from the use of the need for coordination as a pretext to impose subjugation. So hierarchy runs away from the objective need. And instead of being constructed to support coordination, it takes over coordination. So that's why we need a democratized market order, a high energy democracy, to deconstruct that. Now comes a second aspect of estrangement. The second aspect of estrangement has to do with the relation between complexity and union or disunion. So in these comp complex societies, how do we remain united? What is the basis of social cohesion? It's, it can't be tribalism or sameness. That's not enough. Uh, so, Example, concrete example. Faced with greater migratory flows, some of the European societies or their leaders would like to go back to being tribes, but they can't. And then there are a series of perversions and conflicts that arise from this frustrated attempt. So what we would want as progressives is for union to flourish in the midst of difference. And how is that possible? Only through the multiplication of forms of collective action in every department of social life. People doing more things together in more ways. People who are different. And then we think the differences that matter are not the ones that, that matter most, are not the ones that we've inherited, but the ones that we'll create together. The national distinction, a distinct form of life, through the multiplication of these forms of action. Now, there's a third dimension of the experience of estrangement, which is the least understood, the least explored in Uh, in contemporary political and philosophical discourse. And it has to do with the problem of coldness and warmth. So what was the formula 
of these so-called traditional societies before the present age of world history was that in every social relation, there was a mixture of exchange, power, and sentiment or allegiance. So in the relations between rulers and ruled, bosses and underlings, parents and children, men and women, the characteristic social relation was the sentimentalization of unequal exchange. Uh, so there's an, uh, there, there's an exchange of benefits between the superior and the inferior. One has greater power than the other. And then there's an overlay of affect or emotion over this unequal exchange. That was the fundamental formula. The Romans call it, for example, the patron-client relation. And the development of the liberal societies in the modern West destroyed that. That was, that was then viewed as a form of liberation. So theoretically, exchange goes to the market, power goes to politics, and allegiance goes to the f allegiance affect to the family, private life, domesticity. Of course, we know that this decomposition is always incomplete. Uh, now, here is then the problem that results. The problem that results is that as society becomes free or freer, it also becomes cold or colder. That's Schopenhauer's description of the predicament of humanity. So the porcupines in the dark night they come closer together to warm one another. Then they prick one another with their spines. Then they go further apart and they move. They shuffle back and forth restlessly in the dark night, settling into an unstable and uncomfortable middle distance. That's us. And so this, there's this idea of that we can become free only by becoming cold. So Talleyrand said, those who did not live before the revolution do not know the sweetness of life. So the sweetness of life is this overlay of, of, of affect on the unequal exchanges of society. So what are we to do? That's a third dimension of estrangement. What would we want? We would want to be free and warm at the same time. And how are we going to get that? So you say, we love can't flourish outside the sphere of intimacy. One way of understanding philosophically how we could become free and warm at the same time is that social life in all of its departments is transfigured by the imagination. Imagination is the perpetual creation of the new, which energizes us. It's intimately related to this idea of the good of life. Life is surfeit spontaneity, surprise, fecundity. And that then is an interpretation of the slogan of 1968, that revolutionary outburst in the world, imagination and power. So that's another way of defining the aim of the progressives. They want to solve the, the, the triple problem of subjugation, of union, and of coldness. Uh, so that we will not be estranged. We'll have a higher life. And this is a spiritual idea. And it's, it's an idea that goes, that human life can, can, can ascend. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
just like you if you insist upon the opportunity for equal agency as opposed to equal outcome. Yes. Uh, and the combination of both historical legacy of political assassination in the realm of transformative change and the modern day sense making domination of uh, what you call Yes. around that narrative being regressive um, and uh, insufficiently focused on yes. equality of outcome. Yes. Um, and those are just two extreme practical hurdles. Um, but what's the practical implication then of that line of argument? The, the practical implementation, uh, implication is these implicitly silent Of course, of course, because, because what I would say is the practical implication is that it points out something which has been absent from this discussion here, because the discussion is a discussion of ideas, of programs in a, in a non-political setting. It's about politics, but the setting is non-political. Uh, in the real world of conflict, the fundamental criterion of seriousness is a disposition to sacrifice. Because the world has full of these words, these phony words and in which this, the, we can't tell who's lying or who's lying less or more, and there's this fog. And what is the, the, the steel that, that cuts through the fog and shows who's for real and what's real? There's only one. And that's the disposition to sacrificial action. So in, in the reality of transformative action in the world, the, the message of alternative oh, ha, has embodied in this combination of exemplary action and, and visionary teaching or message, it has to be credentialed by sacrifice. And, uh, Without that, it's not, it's not real. It has no authority. So uh, there's no automatic translation of these things we're discussing into the world of real conflict. Because as soon as you enter the, real, the world of real conflict, the problem of sacrifice becomes paramount. And the further you go, the more you have to sacrifice, and you don't know where it stops. And that's, that's I think, the. That's the, the fundamental criterion of distinction between the serious and the frivolous. Now, the disposition to sacrifice is not enough because we, we still have to have light. We have to understand in what direction the sacrifice is given. We need to have understanding that goes beyond this humanizing horizon. But it seems to me that's the central issue that you're observation suggests to me. Yes? You mentioned the assassination of Dr. King, and I wanted to kind of build on that point. Yes. I take it to this, the point that you made about love, because I wasn't able to hear it myself in the last class. Yes. Yes. So my question is, wouldn't it depend on one's conception of love? You mentioned that love doesn't flourish in the public space um, and only imagination. Well, I think well because I'm proceeding from a view which distinguishes love from altruism. So altruism is one thing, and love is another. And uh, in Christianity, the in my view. The organizing principle of the moral love is not altruism, it's, it's love. So what's the difference between love and altruism? So uh, altruism is a gift or a sacrifice from a distance from on high. And altruism, unlike love, can be universal. You don't even have to know the person 
whom you're benefiting, to be altruistic. And uh, it doesn't require equality among the agents. And although it can require even the sacrifice of one's life, it requires no inner jeopardy. Love is completely different because love is about mutual recognition and acceptance. There's a contradiction in the conditions of self-assertion, which we need the others, but the others always threaten us. They jeopardize us with loss of distinction and a freedom. And so to be really free, we have to be able to resolve that contradiction. We have an experience of resolving it in love. Because in love, my connection to the beloved doesn't diminish me or threaten me in any way. Uh, and love then, unlike altruism, has an epistemological threshold. The initial problem in love is the imagination of the other, of the otherness of the other. And so that the other not be a projection just of myself. In, in altruism, we don't have this problem. So the perspective of the traditional academic moral theory is a universalistic and legalistic altruism. Uh, and that's why they think of the moral life and of ethics as a kind of book of accounts, of debits and credits. What do I owe the other? What are my obligations? The objective is to reach the end of one's life with your hands clean. Uh, so it's like the ethic of Pontius Pilate. The, the, their campaigns begin and end in hand washing. And the objective is to be innocent, to be blameless. That's not the perspective of love. So, but love then depends on, depends on intimacy. It depends on connection. It's not this universalistic, distant thing. It requires you to cast down your shield. Its condition is the acceptance of a higher vulnerability. So the premise from which I spoke is love is different from altruism. Love, there's no love among strangers. There is altruism among strangers. And therefore, we can ask, what is the equivalent to love among strangers? One interpretation is it's cooperation among free and equal individuals. But then that has no distinct institutional form. So then there's a struggle over the institutional form. That's the stuff that we've been discussing in economics and in politics. Another equivalent is the imagination. Because the imagination energizes. The imagination, one of the attributes of the imagination is the power of the mind to put aside its own settled methods and presupposition. You discover something that you don't yet understand. And then after the fact, you generate the methods and the assumptions that allow you to make sense of your discovery. That's the imagination. It's not a machine. It's an anti-machine. And so you could say, this was the suggestion I made before, that the reconciliation of freedom with warmth requires warmth to come from a source other than love in life among strangers. And one of those sources is the imagination. Make, make the economic and political institutions share in the quality of the imagination. That was the slogan, imagination in power. So you'll notice that in these last 15 minutes, I'm just approaching the topic of the philosophical assumptions or spiritual message of the progressives from a completely different direction. It's not this direction of associating shared empowerment with structural change. I'm doing it here in, in this moment by a transposition of this Hegelian idea of estrangement in modern society, these three dimensions saying the progressives want to overcome this estrangement through a transformation in each of these aspects having to do with 
subjugation, with disunion, and with coldness. Uh, and it's another way to make the point that's ambition, high ambition. Now, uh, I do want just to remind you of the basic outline of the programmatic argument, given that this may be our last in-person class in the semester. So there are three axes that I've emphasized in our argument in the European and the American context. The first is the democratization of the market order. The market should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. And there are three issues that are paramount in a progressive political economy. The first is the relation of the backward to the advanced parts of production. So we want, if not to overcome, at least to attenuate the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. And we want the most advanced practice, which is now the knowledge economy, to deepen by spreading, to take its most inclusive form. And that doesn't happen spontaneously or vegetatively. We have to organize it. So it depends on productive uplift of the vast majority of regressive firms, especially small and medium-sized firms. And it depends as well on uh, enhancing the equipment of the individual economic agents who are outside firms and transforming them, as I suggested in an earlier discussion, into technologically equipped artisans. The second theme in a progressive political economy is the relation of labor to capital. And there are two urgent uh, topics that come right at the beginning in the historical sequence. Now, the first is the situation of the increasing part of the labor force that is condemned to precarious employment and radical economic insecurity. We need a legal regime to organize, represent, and protect them. And then in the future, beyond that, stands the great question of the eventual supersession of economically dependent wage labor as the main form of free work by the higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation. Only possible in the context of radical innovation in the property regimes, so that self-employment and cooperation can be reconciled with the aggregation of resources at large scale. And the third theme in the progressive political economy is the relation of finance to production. Finance is a bad master, but it can become a good servant. The best way to make it less dangerous is to make it more useful. To enlist it in the service of the productive agenda of society. By discouraging or prohibiting financial activity that has no colorable relation to the expansion of output or productivity. And by multiplying the channels that mobilize uh, saving over current consumption for the production of new assets in new ways. The second great access of such an alternative is then the deepening of democracy. So, political economy and inclusive productivism. The focus now is the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy. And in the organization of political life, a high energy democracy that diminishes the dependence of change on crisis and overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. 
And that demands three or four sets of institutional innovations. Innovations that raise the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life, innovations that hasten the pace of politics by resolving impasse between the political branches of government quickly, for example, through anticipated elections, or comprehensive programmatic plebiscites, and innovations that reconcile decisive initiative by the central government with radical devolution to parts of the society, so that Parts of a country can secede under certain conditions from the dominant solutions and develop counter models of the national future. The society hedges its bets as it goes down a certain path. And we could add a fourth set of innovations, which are gradually to enhance representative democracy with elements of direct democracy. So it's not the substitution of direct democracy by participatory democracy. It's the enhancement of the representative institutions with elements of direct democracy. Now then the third axis, alongside democratizing the market and deepening democracy, is forming the capable agent. Given that the central ideal is an ideal of the enhancement of agency. And the immediate focus is the transformation of, of the character of, of education. A form of education that prioritizes the imaginative side of the mind, the analytic and synthetic capabilities that prefer selective depth to encyclopedic superficiality, that prefers cooperation to the mixture of individualism and authoritarianism, and that approaches every subject dialectically from contrasting points of view. In a context, in a political economic context, that reconciles national standards of investment and quality with the local management of the schools. And in each of these three domains, then, uh, of political economy, the organization of democratic politics, and the reshaping of education, the same fundamental idea that there's a haven for safeguarding and equipping the individual but the counterpart to the haven is the organization of the storm, a perpetual innovation, which allows us to come more fully into the possession of life. Uh, now then, we come to the ideas about agency and structure and the ideas about the ideal that form the background of this programmatic argument and, and, and support it. So every programmatic proposal can be formulated in two registers as a, as a set of innovations, especially institutional innovations, And as the proposal of a set of alliances, of political and social alliances. These aren't two different things. They're two sides of the same thing. Every powerful political project builds its base. And this project points in the direction of a majority coalition, an alliance, that would have to include of uh, four elements, the traditional, organized, relatively secure labor force, the new precarious workers, uh, 
in the unstable part of the labor market. The small business class, which the left historically in the 20th century defined as its enemy with disastrous consequences, and the technical and professional cadres. And the assumption about agency that makes sense of this idea of such an alliance is what you could call the duality thesis. There is always more than one way to define and defend a group or class interest. There is a way that is institutionally conservative and socially exclusive. And there is a way that is institutionally transformative and socially solidaristic. So I gave the example of the interest of the traditional industrial labor force headquartered in declining mass production industry. One way to, def to understand and defend their interests is to say, we build into their present niche, and we protect it against all of its enemies, which include the small business class and the temporary workers. But then we could say, but this has no future. And so the groups that we used to think of as the enemies have to become the allies in the context of the attempt to convert traditional mass production industry into its successor, the knowledge economy. So the proposal of the alliances, or the coalition, is based on the idea of agency. And the idea of agency is based on an approach to the problem of structure. So the supreme target of transformative ambition in politics and political thought is the structure, the, 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 the formative institutional arrangements and ideological assumptions of society. But we shouldn't think of the structure in the way in which Marxist theory, the greatest intellectual influence on the left, represents it. The structure is not a system. Structure, not system. When it changes, it doesn't change all at once. It changes piece by piece and step by step. So the, the fundamental form of structural change in history is what you could call radical reform, which is structural but piecemeal and capable of being cumulative. So every piecemeal change has this ambiguity that it can be a pretext for not going further, or it can be a step toward the next step. And its meaning is determined always by what comes next. So these structures uh, influence social life. They shape social life. They shape what comes next. But the extent to which they determine the future is itself variable. We can have as part of our project to diminish the power of path dependency, the power of the past over the future, and to create institutions that facilitate their own correction in the light of experience. So presupposed in this way of thinking about structure is the whole project of a social theory. It has to be a social theory that, like Marx's, recognizes that the structures of society are our creations. They're not natural phenomena. They're not things. We made them. But it also has to be a way of thinking that, unlike contemporary social science and policy discourse, insists on the primacy of structure, of structural change, and structural alternatives. 
So we think the structures are not there as things, and all our most important material and moral interests are entangled in the attempt to create structures that become progressively less thing-like because they're not just there on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. They, they have this attribute of corrigibility and exemplified by a high-energy democracy or by a deepened and disseminated knowledge economy. So part of the intellectual background to this programmatic argument are these ideas about how to think about structure. Against Marxism on the one hand, and against contemporary social science on the other. Presupposing a form of social theoretical and historical understanding that we don't yet have. It points in a direction. And the other part of the background has to do with the ideal. And the conception of the ideal results in a different understanding of what distinguishes the progressives from the conservatives. Conventional ideas, the progressives accord priority to equality, but to shallow equality, meaning equality against the background of the established economic and political institutions. And then the view is what they want, in, what they want or should want, what they did want in the 19th century in some flawed form and what they should want again is a, a sharing and empowerment in the enhancement of agency. Uh, becoming bigger together and together coming more fully into the possession of life. And the struggle against inequality of circumstance or outcome is entirely subsidiary to this larger goal, which is equality of empowerment or of agency. That's the goal. And the method is radical reform, piecemeal but cumulative structural change against anti-structural reformism and against the fantasy of revolution the total substitution of one system for another. So that understanding of the normative element in the programmatic debate then results in a changed view of what distinguishes the progressives from the conservatives. So at one level, what distinguishes the progressives from the conservatives is that they do not believe that it's natural for human life to be small. And they aspire to this shared ascent to a higher form of life. And at another level, what distinguishes the progressives from the conservatives is that they refuse to take the established institutional arrangements as the horizon within which to pursue the ideals and the interests. They say, nothing is possible, nothing that matters is possible without change in the institutional arrangements and the ideological assumptions. And the change is no less consequential for being piecemeal as it must be in real historical experience. Now, I think that this, among the many perplexing aspects of this, this argument, is its, its biographical dimension. 
and I invite you to reflect on it. So in the very first class, uh, at the start of the semester, I said, uh, my view is that we are living in a counter-revolutionary interlude in a long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. And this way of thinking is then to, to against the biases of the counter-revolutionary interlude. There's a revolutionary project. It has the political side of liberalism, socialism, democracy. It has the personalist side of romanticism, the worldwide popular romantic culture. It is strong and weak at the same time. It's strong because it remains the most powerful agenda in the world. All the others respond to it. But it's weak because it's, it's, its votaries no longer know what its next step should be. And the only way in which we can give power to this revolution is by reinventing it in form and in content, renouncing its conventional form and creating another form. But in all of these experiences of modern history, we, we, we've needed this exogenous shock. It comes in the form of war, economic collapse, like the, like the meteor. Haley's comment that uh, protagonist Pierre in War and Peace sees in the sky prefiguring the invasion of Russia by Napoleon. So we have this biographical question for us, living as we do in the counter-revolutionary interlude. What do we do while we're waiting for the comet? Do we need the comet? Can we dispense with a comet? Uh, and this seems to me to be, the, for me, the, sor the fundamental source of energy. If my life happens to have fallen in a period between the visits of the comet to the Earth, I have to learn to do, deal without the comet. Uh, and, and, not, and not to be resigned to, to an existence bereft of this shaking up. We'll have to do it ourselves in some form, and we have to have the idea of it. Now, this is not the conclusion of the course. This is simply the prelude to a new stage. <laughs> so this is what we always think, we who are hopeful. <laughs> and uh, we have to use the unexpected uh, to serve our purposes. So I will send you uh, a message, probably during the week of the spring recess, with the final writing assignment, which you'll see will be an invitation to engage the argument of the course very broadly. And then I'm going to have to master this technology of, of Zoom and Canvas. Uh, and I, I hope for the best with, uh, with, your, with your patience. And I think what we might do, uh, necessity, the mother of invention, is then to shift to a more dialogic style in these Zoom events. So uh, you'll have your papers to write. They'll provoke your ideas. And instead of my returning to a presentation of these ideas, to expositions, to, to arguments, I'd much rather attempt to proceed in this new stage in a conversational manner. But it will be an ex a new experience for me. So I was, I was once invited by a, a, a publication to write a text, write a text for the London Review of Books in what they said would be a conversational style. And I told the editor, I don't use a conversational style even in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
but we'll have to invent something. So, so, so let's be in close touch. Uh, for whoever is here and for the remainder of the week, uh, I am in my office almost every day from 3.15 to 4.30. So you don't have to make an appointment. You can just come and speak with me. Right now, I have to deal with the computer technicians about this new method. But for the rest of the week, I'll be in my office. See you soon. Yeah. <laughs>